everyone for coming out on such uh, quick, short notice. Uh, uh, this event just really came together over the weekend between Bert and I. Uh, Bert was in town from Europe and South America, and uh, we're pleased that he's able to stop in today and uh, give some thoughts on the state of play uh, developments in European innovation policy and where it's headed over the next two or three years. Uh, uh, Dr. Burton Lees, PhD and MBA, who was a lecturer in European Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the Stanford School of Engineering, uh, where he has successfully developed partnerships with European national and regional governments and industry in Italy, Finland, Denmark, Norway, Ireland, France, Spain, Romania, and Estonia. Dr. Lee also serves as Managing Director of Innovarian Ventures, a financial, technical, and strategic advisory services firm based in Silicon Valley. Dr. Lee is a recognized global expert on innovation ecosystems, entrepreneurship, and new approaches to technology, cluster development, and he serves as an expert evaluator for the FP7 research programs at the European Commission. Uh, Dr. Lee holds a PhD in mechanical and electrical engineering from Stanford, and an MBA in financing entrepreneurship from Cornell. Dr. Lee, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Stephen. Please take away. Um, so I'm pleased to see uh, a gross absence of ties along the way. Um, Silicon Valley, it's quite an honor not to wear these things. So actually, I had a meeting this morning at the IDB, American Development Bank, and everyone around the table didn't have a tie except for me. I was shocked. Um, but please, hopefully you can consider this bit of Silicon Valley culture which we're trying to propagate. Um, so I'm basically going to spend uh, our time today talking about some of the work I've been doing in Europe and my insights, hopefully observations on the European innovation scene, what's being talked about in terms of oh yes, talking. Thank you. Uh, what's going on in the European innovation scene at a European Commission as well as at a national level, regional level? Uh, what's not happening, uh, some of the discussions I think that should be happening in Europe that they're not having, um, and then some broad kind of strategic um, views. Uh, this is also based, what I'll be showing today is in part based on the testimony I gave before the European Parliament in February of that few months ago. And let's, I've got two, two clickers here to manage. Um, so this. This is, I think, what a lot of us <coughs> think of when we think of Europe. Uh, drowning polar bears. Uh, I'm not sure I would have thought of Bono here necessarily um, as, as the first place for, for Ireland. Uh, you see a lot of maps, you know, the view from Silicon Valley, the view from Manhattan, of what the rest of the world looks like, you know, from your own little perch. Um, so what I'm doing from Silicon Valley is trying to add a little bit of depth here uh, and get beyond the sexy spies and social networks to real innovation ecosystems and um, take the lessons we've learned from Silicon Valley and, and uh, do, do a better job, I think, than some of the work that's been done out there in understanding the components of innovation ecosystems and, and how they work. So, so I'll be covering today, uh, just say a little bit more about myself, what we'll be talking about. Basically, I'm going to be focusing on, on what I think are structural impediments to innovation in Europe, which are not being discussed for the most part in, uh, in capitals and in innovation discussions. I'll be particularly focusing on uh, commercialization of European Commission FP research and university reform in Europe, and then a few comments on Europe and Silicon Valley tunnels. Uh, a little bit about myself. So Stephen's already introduced some of my academic background. I've also as well as industry background. Uh, last year served as a member of the Prime Minister's Innovation Task Force in Ireland. Worked with the Commission on a periodic base as an evaluator of FP7 research programs. And give talks in Europe, Latin America, on innovation policy broadly. Uh, what I do, however, mostly is work directly with innovation organizations. So I work, coach, mentor startups, investor groups, venture funds, angel groups, corporations, incubators, universities as well. So I, I get in and work directly at the ground level in the innovation ecosystem. So my, my approach is bottoms up rather than top down. But I use the policy to try and close the loop and take the learning I'm doing at the grassroots level, bring all that up to a national or pan-European level as well. 
And the main reason I'm in town actually right now is because I also serve as an SBIR reviewer for the National Science Foundation, which I was doing yesterday. Um, just a little bit of background about the course I run at Stanford. The European Entrepreneurship Innovation runs every January through March in the engineering school. And we have partnerships with uh, this here, Enterprise Estonia, Lyon Region in France, Innovation Norway, uh, private incubator in uh, Padua, Italy, Southeastern uh, European Private Equity and Venture Capital Association, among other partners. We focus on the broad European innovation scene, so we cover the startup scene, entrepreneurship, venture capital, but we also talk about tech transfer, entrepreneurship education, and enterprise innovation. So we take a broader view, I think, than, um, than many other discussions uh, about innovation in, in Europe and elsewhere. So we focus on the entire innovation ecosystem. Um, over the past three years, these are a number of the partnerships we've developed. Uh, so where you see a logo, that indicates a specific partnership relationship that we've had at one point or another. Uh, Romania, Estonia, Finland, Italy, France. Uh, these relationships have been primarily at the regional level, so the grid region, the Basque region, the all region, the Lille region. These here hit mostly at the national level with Enterprise Ireland, Innovation Center Denmark, Innovation Norway, Enterprise Estonia. These are all either foundations or agencies of national governments. Uh, just some examples of some of the topics we cover. So this past uh, January, we had two of the European leading European strangers in Silicon Valley, Jeff Gladier, uh, Ivan Senku, our first Turkish speaker, talking about what they're doing. They're major players in the uh, Web 2.0 investing space in, in the Valley. Uh, we also did a panel on European incubators in Silicon Valley with Dutch, Italian, Swiss, German, French, Let's see, I get these confused because there's so many. Um, people I, sorry, that's people I, Sweden, and this is playing all French. So we basically talked about why European uh, private incubators are now setting up in, uh, in Silicon Valley, but also why government incubators. So Peter Monod, that's for the Dutch consulate, for example, and SwissNext is also an official Swiss public private partnership, why they're coming to Silicon Valley, and why they're doing this as part of national policy. So, uh, and then we also had a speaker, our former president, Gerard Casper, talk on March 7th on University of Rome in Germany. So, uh, basically what I'm going to be talking about today are structural impediments to innovation in Europe, what is not on the European innovation policy agenda, in other words, blind spots, I think from the European perspective. Uh, part of what I do is look at cultural uh, as well as historical uh, foundations to institutions uh, and question and look at whether those assumptions from the 19th century or earlier really apply today. That's very important when you start talking about the university system. And also as a result, what is and what is not, quote, innovation policy. There are some fairly narrow definitions of innovation policy out there, I think, which uh, prevent people from looking at the broader innovation scene for example, enterprise innovation uh, in many countries is covered under enterprise policy as opposed to innovation policy. I don't think you can really separate the, the two. Um, so in terms of what is on the European innovation agenda today, uh, many of the very obvious things that we're also concerned about here in the United States uh, and elsewhere around the world, formation and investment of risk capital, uh, the, the absence of seed and early stage capital in Europe has been a chronic problem going back many, many years. So this is a source of, of focus both at the national and EU levels, entrepreneur formation, uh, mostly in the form of university entrepreneurship programs at university level, national level also, but the EU has also recently gotten involved here uh, with setting up its own entrepreneurship program. Uh, the development of what they call knowledge networks or broker models as a primary mechanism to try and accelerate innovation by connecting people across national borders, linguistic boundaries. This is also basically an effort to facilitate European integration. <coughs> I use that uh, this has had very limited success. 
uh, the usual focus on tech transfer, IP commercialization. They're all looking at Stanford and MIT, wondering why their universities don't, don't get that same level of performance. Um, and that's primarily at the national level. University reform is has been on the agenda here and there, very spotty in certain countries, not from an innovation perspective. It's really been driven uh, for separate reasons. But in general, it's you know, for most countries in Europe, university reform is off the innovation agenda because uh, sometimes the way the ministries divide up responsibilities for economy, typically you have an education or research ministry which may handle higher education systems, uh, which may be separate from the economy ministry, and so you get these institutional boundaries uh, artificially segmenting up the discussion space about what is and isn't innovation policy. Limited legal reform. And infrastructure, infrastructure is an easy one because that is essentially about uh, construction jobs, laying cable, building new incubators, science technology parks. So everyone loves infrastructure projects because they have a no-brainer from a local point of view. Uh, we'll touch on that. That's a, I mean, each of these areas we can do an hour-long talk. Um, so this again is a quick overview. And Please feel free to jump in with questions. Uh, don't want to be just a talking head here before you go until 1.30. Right. Yeah. Um, so uh, what is not what, what I view as missing in the <coughs> dialogue about innovation is bringing in enterprise innovation, um, specifically uh, issues such as why European corporations typically lag US in adoption of new ICT technologies, use of ICT as a strategic technology, this in turn leads to uh, chronic underperformance of European corporations when it comes to productivity and higher cost structures. And uh, for example, Nokia, Nokia's loss of the smartphone momentum and leadership to Google and Apple over the past three years has been a huge blow to the Finnish economy uh, and to other parts of Europe. Uh, it's clearly a, a, an issue on the innovation scene but it's typically not considered innovation because innovation policy usually concerns itself more with the startup sector. Uh, my view is that you, you cannot disconnect these, these two. Um, monitoring of outcomes of EU and national innovation programs. A lot of money being thrown at innovation programs in Europe. Uh, I'm most familiar with those at the European Union level. Incubators, science and technology parks, and a lot of the infrastructure, brokers, knowledge networks with very little output and you see very little measurement uh, of outcomes from these large innovation programs in, in Europe. Uh, commercialization of research from EU research programs, this is something I'll focus particularly on today. This is a major gap in European Commission strategy. Uh, essentially, there is almost no generation of new companies out of FP7 research. We'll go into some depth on that. And then uh, also what is missing in the innovation agenda dialogue are notions of competency, such as product design, such as use of ICT, for example, project management. Um, innovation policy typically revolves around institutions, uh, you know, the absence of capital, those types of discussions, intellectual property, but rarely are there discussions of specific competencies, um, which in the case of Silicon Valley are extremely important. So in Silicon Valley, after companies are founded, they have to maintain themselves, sustain themselves, grow, uh, essentially through developing great products over and over again. So product design is a very important competency. Uh, this is a structural gap in most European countries, the only countries in Europe which have strong product design applications and programs in engineering and medical schools are Germany, Netherlands, and Scandinavian most of the other countries around that core, Ireland, Portugal, Spain, uh, up through southern Italy, Greece, Turkey, and Eastern Europe, simply have never developed a product design tradition. And therefore, uh, they don't teach it as a discipline in their universities. And as a result, graduate engineers, business people, business students graduate without any understanding of product design. And this is what keeps Cisco, Google, Apple, you know, Apple's all that great product design. This is, this is what keeps the engine of Silicon Valley growing uh, and going on an ongoing basis. So it's an absence. This is one example of discussion and understanding of innovation systems that we don't see in Europe. 
and in, in most other places around the world. So just to kind of go through a, a somewhat uh, complete list, but uh, this is something that we're still tweaking and adding to uh, in terms of what are, from my perspective, major structural impediments to innovation in Europe. Uh, I think that the, one of the key problems in Europe is the way people and institutions form networks <coughs> in, in Europe, and you see this in the way people use LinkedIn and Facebook in Europe. Uh, typically, uh, institutions and individuals form small, closed, professional, and personal networks. Uh, and these are typically built along national or, or linguistic lines. So Danes hang out of Danes, Germans or Germans. You don't see much in Germany when you cross national boundaries. In Silicon Valley, a lot of what I do is connect Europeans with other Europeans because they come talk to the Americans. Um, and, and we know, because of my work pan-European, uh, that a lot of initiatives in Europe that uh, the Europeans, other Europeans don't know about because they are across national boundaries. Uh, I can give you some specific examples of that later. Uh, but the, the, the view of how networks should be formed in Europe, both at a personal and professional level, restricts information sharing, it makes it more difficult to build trust, develop collaborations, and to build a global vision of impact. So this is this is a this is another way of saying that Europe is very fragmented, but this is a, a little bit more technical in terms of the underlying analysis of the network theory point of view. But if you cannot build open networks that transmit information quickly, uh, that have efficient processes that can come together, collaborate regular basis, it's very difficult to build a robust, uh, flexible innovation system. Um, there's a broad absence of institutions and processes that scale in Europe. I'll say more about that in the next slide. Uh, universities are a big issue, not only in Europe, but also globally, uh, where university organizations, institutions, essentially were set up in the uh, second half of the 19th century or the 20th century in Europe couple of issues. One is the separation of the major business schools from the engineering and medical schools. Uh, by this separation, I mean physical separation, you have NCI miles away from the nearest engineering school. Okay. Um, Instituto de Empresa in Madrid, ESA, uh, in Sabe, uh, in Spain, the top Spanish business schools all off on their own. London School of Business. The, the only business schools of any rank in Europe that really have a close connection that are part of a campus system are Oxford and Cambridge. Um, and those are relative newcomers. So what 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 happens when you separate business from engineering schools is you you create a corporate leadership class that is not very familiar understanding technology, that does not integrate engineers and scientists into the corporate strategy, that has a hard time integration integrating technology strategy with the corporate strategy. And I think it, the separation of business schools is one of the reasons why European corporations have a much more difficult time adopting the latest ICT technologies and enterprise software systems. Um, outdated university models. Most universities in Europe are built around public institutions with teaching as their primary uh, mission versus research. Stanford, MIT, our universities here are research first universities. It's a very important distinction research versus teaching first. And as a result, they have difficulty in building industry university collaborations. This is a chronic problem most, across most European universities and countries. The absence of key core competencies, as I mentioned earlier, such as product design, um, something which I recently beginning to turn attention to uh, is the prevalence of family-owned companies. Now in Germany, the Mittelstand is an extremely important part of the German economic system. Very, very strong set of companies uh, in, uh, for example, the machining industry. Um, the difficulty, the, the disadvantage of having family-owned firms is that they never go public. The value they create never gets recycled into the broader economy. Uh, whereas here in the United States, people, people grow companies, they sell them, then they start, they invest, develop a new generation of startups around them. In Europe, you have a tremendous amount of value locked up inside family, family companies, which never gets capitalized, and as, as a result, never gets reinvested into the uh, European economy. So I think it would be interesting to generally 
try and come up with a figure as to the value of family-owned companies in terms of you know, potential stock market valuation in Europe and estimates um, how much capital could be freed up if those companies went public and what that might do for uh, European innovation and, and incentives. Um, but generally, I, I think that while well, some of the best-run companies in Europe are, are family-owned, uh, there's a downside to, to a very large family-owned sector in that it can inhibit growth and recycling of both investment capital and management talent into new, new generation of companies. And then generally, Europe has a difficult time creating new institutional models because the legal system is very, very rigid. Uh, as a result, you don't see, uh, in the case of foundations, you see almost no pan-European foundations. They're all really at a national level. Uh, Europe does not have the innovation and enterprises sector like we've developed here in the past five, six, seven years with XPRIZE Foundation, for example. Um, and uh, student entrepreneurship societies, which a couple countries are playing key roles as part of national innovation systems, uh, simply don't re get recognition by policymakers, by leaders, because they're students and they're just a club instead of a formal established organization. Um, they're bringing the university base. Yeah. Well, uh, so they honored uh, Christo Vasca actually in Zurich at the last ACES Award, who led the, um, it's currently leading, founded the Alta Entrepreneurship Society, basically the main Finnish student group. They gave him an award for what he did in basically growing it into Europe's leading student entrepreneurship group. Um, I haven't attended any of the ACES events. I know Richard and the Science Business guys. I think they are rare in Europe in terms of having a pan-European vision. Um, I think they're trying to bridge, break down some of these networks. I think they have a, a broader vision than many Europeans. Uh, Science Business is actually a couple of Americans working out of Brussels. Um, so I support their work, and I'd like to see them succeed. Did you have something more specific? Well, I just want to know in what level they, they were specific in whether or not they were modeled to, to uh, accomplish some things you said any uh, Well, they're a relatively small company, basically doing you know, executive education conferences, events. Uh, I haven't attended any of their events. We need more like them, whether they can scale up and have a broader pan European impact. Uh, remains to be seen. Um, before you go, before you go on to the European uh, the scale up problem, could you talk a little bit about the variation inside, both inside regions and across European countries on some of those structural items? Because it seems to me just going, looking at a few of them, such as the uh, family-owned firms or um, you know, some of the uh, absence of institutions, you could argue that some countries, Finland, <coughs> for example, is at one end yes. and Italy may be at the other. So could you elaborate a little bit more on the variation? There is a lot of variation. Um, and uh, it's difficult to capture that in a talk as short as this. Um, and you know, I'm still trying to come up with the appropriate graphics to actually represent that variation um, because this is you know, a multi-dimensional space we're, we're working in here. Uh, but yes, in general, you know, Finland is probably one of the more um, innovative countries in terms of coming up with new, uh, new innovation organizations and institutional innovations. Um, they've, uh, they seem to be able to adapt to ICT technologies far more quickly than other European societies. Uh, the Finns have a very tight network in Silicon Valley. It's, it's no accident that a Finnish student group really has, uh, is the leading student entrepreneurship society today in Europe and is now building out ties to Stanford and other uh, organizations in Silicon Valley. Uh, if you look at most Mediterranean countries, a uh, very different picture, uh, much more rigid systems. Um, the, some of these groups go back very, very deep to, in the case of Spain and Portugal, to the Spanish Inquisition, uh, which has really inhibited the participation of Spanish universities in scientific endeavors for hundreds of years. Um, so, yes, there's a huge di difference, uh, variation. You know, essentially, I think you can 
group of Scandinavian countries, Germany, Netherlands together, Protestant countries, uh, as being uh, further further ahead in many ways in many of these areas. They typically have the best best universities. Uh, Ireland is is a player. Uh, they have certain restrictions. I'll say a few words on Ireland at the very end. Uh, UK is definitely getting their act together, uh, especially just in the last few months. They've made some very interesting announcements regarding universities and funding and, and entrepreneurship. But for the most part, the rest of Europe uh, simply is, is not, and, you know, with both European governments, universities, and corporations are not, in my view, really waking up to the challenges facing Europe on the innovation scene. And part, of, part of my stress, part of my emphasis here is to talk about what the leadership of universities, corporations, governments are not talking about. Um, you don't see these kinds of discussions at the European Commission. So I think part of what's missing in Europe is a really fundamental understanding of the historical, cultural, legal roots of their institutions and, and a failure to question those roots at a very fundamental level. Um, so that's the best I can do in, in the space we have. Okay. Yeah. Which university you are from here with Norway? What was your Norway? Uh, I have not been in Norway so, for many, many years, so not not that. Uh, you might be challenged just in Norway in your state because in Oslo you have Oslo University and Oslo Research Park. High concentration is uh, probably one of the best in Europe. I yes. see a commission in that management center where you have this track, but then you have North, the technical institute. And there are two companies in So there is inside Norway some of the same conflict in Sweden. I agree with you for Finland. Then if we take France, although why you may have uh, Lyon, but also quite a few of them. But just last week a report was much more encouraging. But most of your statements have been true, and some of them are still true. But something is changing. And these are these are Scandinavian countries in addition to Finland. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and very, very much. So, okay. um, and France, Bordeaux, France. There are big differences, so I'm trying to kind of paint the broad <coughs> picture here. Um, you, know, you, you can't place German universities on the same scale with, with Spanish, wide variations. Um, and so part of what I'm going to be doing here is pointing out which countries have undertaken university reform <coughs> and noting who's off that list, for example. And keep in mind that out of 27 countries in the European Union, the only ones that are really we keep, we'll keep coming back to is really kind of getting it and trying to reform their systems are the Scandinavian countries, the Netherlands, Germany, UK, a bit, Ireland. Uh, France is undertaking some moves here, but uh, them and Italy and Spain and Greece, big laggards uh, and have a very difficult time pulling together a consensus at the national level about, about these issues. So, um, Yes, you know, I need to do a better job of depicting the diversity of institutions here and, and the differences between the countries. Um, what we do at Silicon Valley, first and foremost, is scale the companies to a global level very quickly and very efficiently. And this, at the core, is what's missing in Europe. It's the absence of scale, the absence of the ability to scale companies in Europe. There are some exceptions. Skype, for example. Skype did have U.S. investors from the Valley at the very beginning. Um, but this fragmentation of markets and laws, the fragmentation of the personal and professional social networks, uh, the skepticism about social media, for example, um, and the continually small, in, you know, closed inward-looking vision. You know, Danes think first and foremost about Denmark. Um, they, when I was there in November, I asked them why they're not really doing anything serious in, in wave power and ocean energy. Well, they had one project which failed. Um, and so they said, oh, well, the wave power doesn't work. Uh, they didn't bother to look across the channel to Scotland and England, who have several wave power companies, some of whom have come to the US and receiving market EDOE money. So again, you know, very limited perspectives, uh, failure to look at 
across the borders. Uh, Europeans tend to look much more readily to the United States for connections than uh, to their neighbors. And so this, this is a very specific instance of what I call small closed networks fragmentation of, of the European network space. Um, that, the, the way the networks are formed and structured has a big impact on, uh, on what you can do then, uh, both in terms of raising capital, assembling talent, um, and understanding the global picture of the market space. So now I'm going to focus on specifically FP7 research outcomes for the European Commission, European Union. For those of you who aren't familiar with FP7, this is essentially the cornerstone research program of the European Commission, ongoing for another two years, a total sum of 53 billion, so on average uh, a little over 7 billion a year um, across these five areas. And I mean, there's a lot more detail here. You know, ICT technologies, space technologies, uh, energy, transportation. There's over you know, a couple dozen, uh, about two dozen research areas. Uh, so it's a very large research program and it's going to get even larger in 2014 when the new FP8 uh, framework program 8 comes on board. And that's basically what they're putting in place now and getting, getting ready for. Um, so, oops, sorry. What I was talking about. Okay, I was on the last chart. Um, so uh, just to go over again, 53 billion over seven years. Uh, this includes space, ICT, uh, transportation, and about on the order of two, two dozen uh, thematic project areas. Um, <coughs> today, the European Commission, there is no formal framework or program for commercializing any research coming out of FP7 projects. So here you have. Uh, over seven years, approximately, let's say, um, 65, 70 billion dollars worth of research. There's no commercialization, follow-on effort or structure to take any of, it, of the intellectual property coming out of this program into commercial outcomes. Um, so, what what they should have is something like this, where you have. Pre-competitive research going on up front, some kind of intermediate transition phase productization, and market introduction either through startup companies or established firms. Well, in terms of formal EU programs, all they have is this. There's no concept whatsoever. Right. Okay. I think you made reference only to research. I'm talking FP7. Yeah, but FP7 is only part. So you have post program, you have CIP program, both go there. But you're right, they do not connect formally inside framework programs, what they call FP. Right. And what I'm saying that the Americans have a lot of to do and opportunities. Because now they allocated uh, EU 2020, much money. You have cohesion funds, you have CIP, you have more money than for research, go there, but Europe had to create the thing, uh, had a priority to integrate other countries. So I think if you have a comment about that part, FFP is only research. I'm, I'm commenting on the second figure. So uh, for the picture, you may have to make a comment for that, because it might appear distorted from a bank of effect. But that part is very important. More money go there than there in Europe. So just to give some concrete examples mm -hmm. of the difficulty of commercializing outcomes, uh, out of that 53 billion euros, out of all the hundreds, maybe a couple thousand projects that are conducted over their seven years, there's no way, no place you can go to find out about any intellectual property or patents or licenses generated from those projects. Um, it's totally, it's a black box, okay? So it's very difficult to find out what came out. This is an example of what I was saying about the lack of connecting programmatic policy objectives to outcomes. Um, right, Robert John Smith, when he was here in D.C. a couple months ago at the European Institute, he had talked about creating such a portal, about creating an idea of ideas for Europe, a bunch of writing, but, 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 but the stone drawing part of something. Like 
Yeah, so I feel it's totally, totally bureaucratic. I, I run four programs in European Union, <coughs> all of them have been. And you have to close your program bureaucratically and the follow up, the implementation. Nobody takes responsibility. Right. right. Yeah, right. There's, there's no responsibility. This simply is not part of the concept. Um, and I've had discussions with this with the head of cabinet for the commissioner for research, Katie Winstead. Um, and as of February, they really hadn't figured out that they need something like this. But was the point of giving innovation to DG Research and taking it from DG Enterprise going to get at this problem? Um, no. I think they were, there were other issues uh, inside politics. Um, but no, I, I mean, the bureaucrats in the commission generally do not understand that, that they're missing this piece. So you, you have to understand the primary objective of the European Commission is to distribute funds. It's integration, okay, around, around Europe. And integration, <coughs> shoveling money out the door, it's, it's not about, there's, there's no sense of measurement or efficiency or achievement of goals. It, it's all about uh, job creation. Um, but in terms of closing the loop, I think there's there might actually be some resistance out of national capitals to doing that because that means hiring more, more European Commission staffers and it means putting in place an entire accountability framework staffing, which just grows the bureaucracy in Brussels. So it's... Uh, but aren't they looking at a equivalent to the Star Matrix program is it that we're doing here? I'm not familiar with that program. They are the out of National Science Foundation called Star Matrix that is trying to evaluate the benefits of research. So you know better where to go. I thought they are trying. But that's the difference between the successfulness of research and the successfulness of research being <laughs> commercialized. They they do research effectiveness studies kind of at a macro level, but those tend to be kind of economic level studies. They they don't they don't have specific uh, mechanisms at this level to really facilitate on a patent by patent basis. And Understand the, the difference? Yeah, uh, yeah. But there are specific programs, what you say there. Yep. And this is uh, uh, what the gentleman is addressing. Because your wife is FB, correct? But there's a lot of money going there, and we need in Europe the Americans for that And I mean, from, from, again, the European Commission is a very large, very complex organization. You have the Regional funds under DG Regio, so you, you have how many, how many directorates? 27 in each country. Um, and uh, I think part of the reason they don't really close the loop on outcomes <coughs> is because uh, of the potential for embarrassment of countries and of, of director generals who are running their specific programs. Uh, it's very difficult to keep this you know, politically cohesive. <coughs> In there. So the, the discussions I've had at the commission on this issue, there's been pushback. It's not been clear exactly why they're resistant to doing this. I mean, it's clearly more work. So we think uh, that as well. Yes. Um, so let, let me just go back here. Yes, sir. Let's ask about partnerships, research partnerships. And so much of EU funding seems to be tied to like local support, right? They require local councils and other things to come up with matching funds for a lot of these grant programs. You see that in research initiatives as well, where local organizations, universities, have to come up with matching funds. Yes, there is a requirement for matching funds. It varies from program to program. Uh, I'm personally most familiar with MP7 Space. So the European Commission has its own space program separate from the European Space Agency. A lot of Americans aren't aware that it's small, it's 200 million euros a year. Um, but yes, there's a matching funding requirement those programs, it varies again from program to program, can be typically between 25% and 50%, for, for example. Uh, this, this is an area where actually the European Commission is opening up uh, funding opportunities for U.S. organizations. Uh, this is an opportunity for U.S. universities and corporations to participate. The difficulty is that it's hard for U.S. organizations to understand which consortia are being formed in Europe and how to find partners. Um, you know, further west.
fast you go in the U.S., you know, it's even harder for your for U.S. universities and companies to, to engage during the consortium formation process. And U.S. companies and universities can't get money, right? No, they can get money. They can get money? As yeah. part of consortium, yes. Yeah. Not for all FP programs, so there's a bilateral <coughs> agreement, innovation agreement between the European Commission and the U.S. U.S. government, and space and security were added to that two years ago. Uh, there are a number of other areas. This is not broadly understood uh, here in the U.S. Uh, I think in part because the European Commission does a really horrible job of publicizing these programs. I've been involved in uh, information sessions here in the U.S. on FP7 space. And you know, they come over and do a dog and pony show, but they don't really put in place the mechanisms which make it easy for U.S. universities and companies to engage and go through the proposal writing process. I mean, the barrier entry here is quite common. Um, but yes, there you can get serious money uh, at the university or company. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. 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 Fifteen years. Just to um, specify that a bit, the framework programs are indeed open to everyone globally. However, the funding regime is different. So, industrialized countries, uh, since they don't contribute and they don't need the funding from, say, European taxpayers' money, if they use U.S. rhetorics, um, they they have to come up with their own funding. So. A U.S. university would be expected then to approach NSF. That's, that was my understanding. Yeah, yes. However, uh, however, however, on an exceptional basis, if it's required for the project, even U.S. organizations can get funding from the framework program. But the first, the first thing, the rule is that industrialized countries' organizations have to come up with their own funding. But then, if you look at the figures, it's pretty interesting. The exception, like in the case of the US, is pretty substantial. So US organizations, even companies, get quite a bit of funding. So bottom line is, a lot is possible if the specific project requires them. But it's an interesting point to keep in mind, because what it nurtures, what this entire largest international cooperative research program nurtures is a culture of cooperation based on specific issues. And that's an important point here. Um, we're about halfway through and we have 15 minutes left. So, um, <coughs> so uh, just want to give a concrete example of some of the steps that would be necessary to integrate, to bring a commercialization component, um, just to give a concrete example. So when I serve as an, an evaluator for FP7 space projects, uh, because of my background, I they, they have one of the criteria is impact. And under formal EU rules, commercialization potential cannot be considered under impact because that's no longer research. So I've, I've been actively discouraged in Brussels by officials. You know, when I say, well, this has great commercialization potential. Oh, we can't consider that. You know, we can't talk about that because that's, that's not compatible with research objectives here. Um, so you, you have to broaden this definition. You, you have to, for example, formally include commercial potential. This, you know, I'm talking about actual language changes in the documentation for RFPs, for calls. Uh, include commercial potential as a formal criterion. Uh, doesn't apply across all the board. There is some very basic research where commercialization potential would not be appropriate. But direct directions to expert evaluators, reviewers should include commercialization potential uh, as, as well. You need to broaden the selection panels to include people with industry experience, investors, entrepreneurs, tech transfer experts. You need to provide improved visibility of FP project outcomes. I was talking about the central repository database of intellectual property that's generated from FP7 programs. And you also have to then start tracking the outcomes from these programs, much like the NSF does with its, its SBIR program. None of this exists right now. Um, and a lot of this could be easily 
done with just some minor changes in language in, in the calls and selection procedures of the experts. Um, now, a concrete example, which I presented, is specifically in the space area where the European Space Agency has created an entire innovation ecosystem. They have their own incubators. They've established a relationship with European business angel groups. They've set up their own venture fund. Um, so ESA, over in Nordvik, two hours by train, has the entire infrastructure for commercialization of space and growing space startups. So why not link F37 space, guys in Brussels, to what's happening in Nordvik? Well, gee, we can't do that. Why not? Just not allowed to have it. We can't even have lunch to talk about these issues. Um, so this is a very, so here's a very concrete, very specific <coughs> example where there's already an infrastructure in place. If they would just talk to one another, if the FP7 program could start feeding companies and ideas and outcomes out of the consortium into the city computer network, this could really start generating additional jobs to companies. But for bureaucratic or political, I, I, you know, it's hard to know sometimes what the real motivations inside the commission are. They aren't willing to do this. And I've talked with the head of FP7 Space on this issue. So uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about university reform. Uh, hopefully this will give a little bit more of a flavor of the differences uh, across some of the national uh, jurisdictions. Um, very Compared to US uh, universities, there are relatively few European universities in, in the top rankings. Um, and the ones that are are the usual suspects, you know, ETH, Z, and Zurich, so the Swiss universities, a few German, British, Oxford, Cambridge, for example. Um, generally, universities are really <coughs> underfunded. The annual budget for Stanford is $3.8 billion. $3.8 billion for Stanford alone. I mean, that dwarfs the national university budgets of a number of European countries. Uh, universities, because of their historical roots, are often misaligned and disconnected from the national innovation systems. Um, and you also find this generally, this is the case in uh, Latin America and Africa as well, and other major parts of the world, where university systems have, essentially they've been set up around teaching as a primary mission instead of research. Um, part of the, and the way the responsibility for universities is set up is it's typically at a national or regional level. In, in Europe, in the case of Germany, uh, you essentially have the Bundesländer responsible for universities, although the national governments playing more of a role in the excellence initiative, but the EU, Brussels, has no formal jurisdiction over the university systems in, in Europe. Um, raising the rankings of national universities is becoming a priority for the governments of Ireland, Germany, and many other countries, because they understand that if you don't have top-ranked universities around research, uh, your, your entire innovation ecosystem is not going to be at a global level. So I'll just quickly go through this. Um, and again, point, key points here are that European universities, many of them, Germany's, uh, Switzerland, UK, more countries, uh, more of an exception, here to teaching as a primary mission, uh, generate relatively little intellectual property, don't work well with, with industry or commercialization, professors have very little industry experience, and see little value in acquiring that, uh, little encouragement of entrepreneurship by students. Um, so, just quickly, action agenda. Uh, universities need to be reviewed in terms of what their priorities are, teaching versus research, for example. Um, sometimes because universities, many countries, they're authorized, it's written into national legislation. If they're public universities, the sense these changes have to be done in law. Uh, reorganization of the academic business units, new financial and business models. Uh, restructuring of faculty incentives, and build out of innovation entrepreneurship programs and organizations. Um, now, this, this is an area that I've been talking a lot about. It's based on the Finnish example of the Alto Entrepreneurship Society, what students have really done. Uh, I'd like to see the European Commission or national governments start funding student groups at a serious level, you know, of tens of thousands of euros a year, so they can actually um, start engaging with, uh, with investors, create incubators, come to Silicon Valley, um, and be more than just a usual student group. 
Isn't that kind of inconsistent with what you were saying about the over-reliance on government and just independent organizations in general? I mean, I have noticed that like think tanks, for instance, that are government supported are much less entrepreneurial, much less interested in changing things. And right. Um, I mean, my preference would be, yes, industry or foundation support. It's not clear that companies would step up to the plate here. In the case of the Finnish Alpha Entrepreneurship Society, they have been supported by Texas Finnish Innovation Agency at 200,000 euros a year. So some recent examples of university reform in Germany, Ireland, Finland, Luxembourg. This is not a comprehensive listing across Europe. Um, a few comments about connecting Europe to Silicon Valley. Um, Silicon Valley is very important for Europe. We're seeing increasing numbers of regions and countries coming, um, principally because they understand that uh, Silicon Valley can scale up their companies, create new jobs back home faster than if they keep the companies back home and keep them small and don't give them access to talent and capital. Um, so access to customers, companies, uh, latest technology, uh, alternative innovation models, again, uh, we have a much uh, stronger, broader global network and vision in, in the Valley. Um, and at Stanford, Berkeley, we have many, many European scientists, doctors, engineers being trained or teaching as faculty. Is that happening in Boston? Yes. In Boston, you were just using Silicon Valley as an example. It's yes. being replicated elsewhere. Well, they have to scale. Yeah. It, it's all about scale. I mean, the Europeans don't go to Boston in the same scale that they come to the Valley because Boston simply doesn't have the infrastructure and ecosystem that the Valley has. Yeah, I mean, the state of Massachusetts has tried to grow 128 into a region comparable, and it simply hasn't. It has not, you know, I think around 10% of the size of the Valley. Boston simply is closer, but it doesn't have the scale of potential and capability that the Valley does. Well, it's more than some bias. Okay, I was one of the two. Um, a few other issues, so I've talked about product design teaching research programs, um, also the discussion about setting up an e innovation center in Silicon Valley. Uh, there need to be a number of studies done. Uh, this is where foundations or universities, you know, I, I think European business schools could be doing a lot better job uh, contributing to the innovation dialogue by, for example, studying job creation in Europe by bringing companies to Silicon Valley. No one's got numbers there. There's a lot of examples. This is an important policy issue because this is typically the first stumbling block that European governments come up with when they start thinking about should we have an operation in Silicon Valley? How can we justify to our parliament, public, taking our startups to Silicon Valley? You need the hard data here in terms of what other European countries, companies have done in terms of new jobs created back, money back home. Uh, a quick update on Ireland. Um, so the Innovation Task Force, I was a member of that, completed our final report in March of last year. Uh, this is just a short list of some of the recommendations for forming bankruptcy law or rationalization of the university IP. Um, the only accomplishments last year really were an increase in risk capital, so a couple of new venture funds, government uh, served as a limited partner there. Um, firstly, I introduced Irish universities to Stanford Engineering and Medicine. But other than that, there have been no legislative changes, no changes to bankruptcy law in the past year. This is when the Prime Minister controlled Parliament. So why, why not? I don't know. I haven't been to Ireland in a year. And we just had a new government elected last January. So uh, any other questions? How are we doing? Two minutes. So let me uh, just make a couple of remarks. Uh, we, uh, I know uh, my colleague Rob Atkinson is a stickler for hard stops at pointed hours. Uh, so it's 12.30 now. Uh, I'd like to extend the Q&A period for about 10 minutes if we can, but I understand that we only ask you to be here until 12.30, so uh, if you have other points to attend to, please feel free to, uh, to get up and go. But let's carry on for 10 minutes if there's interest in questions. Um, I know there are at least 27 EU countries more applying for membership, so it's hard to give uh, you know, a single answer when you got 27 different countries, but I think that was an excellent overview of the state of play in European innovation policy in general, um, with uh, understanding the differences across specific countries. Um, I want to amplify a couple of comments you made uh, briefly. Um, you've probably seen the ITF report on boosting European productivity through the use of information technology. But the data shows quite clearly that, that from about World War II to 1995, 
productivity growth in Europe was faster than the United States, but after 1995, those numbers converted, and the US accelerated ahead of the European Union and or European countries in productivity growth. And the evidence is quite clear that one of the reasons why is the superior use of information technology in US society and US businesses. So I think uh, we see that that trend will have some continues today. Yes. Um, one other just comments. I spent the last week in California. I've done for five years now um, in San Francisco a uh, entrepreneurship and innovation in Silicon Valley boot camp for about 50 Norwegian executives. And so they come and they want to visit the Valley companies and learn about innovation. Uh, but what we constantly find is that um, they, they kind of take a clinical approach to innovation, almost that it's a, a incremental innovation, a, a, box, a box to be checked mark that we came, we saw, we understand innovation a little bit more. And I guess what I'm saying there is that uh, Joseph Schumpeter was a European, but most Europeans aren't Schumpeterians, in the sense that in many cases they aren't ready to accept the radical changes that disruptive innovation can bring to a society. They ultimately want safe innovation. And while I think this is truer for the Nordic countries than perhaps others, um, if you want to come into Norway specifically, but many Scandinavian countries, and really disrupt society with a radical disruptive innovation, to some extent it's really down upon. You're an entrepreneur, you're trying to get filthy rich. One of venture capitalists I talked to said, successful innovators and entrepreneurs have a rational ambition to change the world. That just can't be understood by normal human beings. So I think this is another challenge for Europe, is really grasping the implications of truly disruptive innovation uh, and, and what that would mean. Um, so those are my thoughts. Uh, please, uh, questions from the audience. Uh, I wanted to ask whether you saw a OECD discussion with multi-year innovation strategy, whether that had any substantial impact on thinking in Europe. And at least the OECD is not so operationally engaged in governance in a way that the right mission is. Um, I'm not that familiar with OECD's work. Um, some of the folks there, and I have not seen their latest study. Where I personally see OECD have an impact is in so in the metrics area, where, for example, they come up with metrics such as numbers of PhDs in terms of measuring research impact, numbers of PhDs, numbers of publications generated. In Ireland, I saw this being filtered down to, through the prime minister's office to the heads of universities to the individual professors and how they were assessed and how research programs. My view, these metrics sometimes distorted and took away, you know, where the real focus should should have been. So I think that's a general issue with macro metrics if, if they're used applied a bit too diligently. So other than that, I can't really directly comment on what those is doing. But but I think my impression is that the European Commission and the other people look to the OECD <coughs> for guidance in, in this area. I, the reason I work at a bottom-up level rather than top-down is because I think that taking only economics-based approach to developing innovation clusters is dangerous. You have to get in there and really understand and work with startups, investor groups, and, and approach it both from bottom-up and, and top-down. And in Europe, it's pretty much just a top-down thing right now. Is that the um, comparison? Pulling back the innovation there, and is there an effort to uh, do that? Uh, I piracy in Europe, or yes. I've never heard it discussed in the European context as, as a major issue. But then again, I've never had discussions specifically on that topic. It's I've spent most of my time working more on the entrepreneurship side rather than the enterprise side. It's certainly never, never ever seen it raised as a major policy issue. Commissioner Gordon, do you mean how Europeans are affected by the impact of piracy going on in other regions in the world, or I don't think piracy that might occur in Europe? In Europe. I think probably should study very bureaucratically or the information from the privacy issue. And the problem with the Scandinavia and France would not be very deep. And Poland is taking a real strong in part because they're hoping to attract U.S. companies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me be a bit more provocative and challenge you a bit more. Please. One could, one could say this is a 
perfect uh, business development approach for Silicon Valley, <laughs> which is fair. But in a sense, European innovation policy is a bit more complex, particularly considering the interaction of the European Commission as a driving force, the Council of the Parliament, and the developments in the member states. So it's quite a unique setting. So what I'm surprised not to have seen, as much as I agree with several of your points, uh, but I haven't seen a particular more comprehensive model that you apply in terms of innovation to be driven. So I would like to understand what's your, what's your thinking behind that. Uh, because Silicon Valley is, I mean, that's a particular example. It's a great example. But it's different in scale, in purpose. So I would like to understand your model of thinking in terms of driving innovation uh, in, in Europe. Um, well, model can mean many different things. I'm not sure exactly what you're, what you're looking for. Um, I think in Silicon Valley, we, what we have is scale, but we have most of the pieces which other regions are missing. And part of what I do in Europe and in Latin America is based on what we have in, in the Valley, but also on, on work I'm doing outside the U.S. Or, and here in Washington. I point out major missing pieces in thinking about innovation. For example, um, product design. You know, this issue of competencies, uh, of skill sets, um, is on the agenda. It's you know, product design is people just don't, you know, if you're not in the tech space, if you're not a product designer in engineering in medical school, you typically would not understand the importance of great product design and why it's part of <coughs> teaching research programs. So I'm not sure, you know, basically what I'm doing is taking a comparative approach. Uh, looking at you know, Silicon Valley innovation ecosystem, but not only there. Look, I look elsewhere you know, because there are in, in Europe. Europe does some things much better than we do, such as innovation policy in, in, in many ways. But in terms of the actual actors, the institutions, um, you know, if I think the Valley is a very good reference point for how to properly set up these institutions at the grassroots level, angel groups startup companies, corporations, universities. I mean, European universities are being pushed towards the American model slowly. Uh, and I think inexorably, because governments are not going to be able to continue to afford to subsidize student fees for, you know, for centuries. So universities in Europe are going to have to develop their own endowments, have to develop their own alumni groups. They're going to become much closer to US universities in, in that sense. So. I don't think I'm totally answer, giving you a satisfactory <laughs> answer. But, but that's, that's part of the, 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 the challenge, because, because the art probably and the particular challenge in Europe is going to be to bring different interests, different, develop, different developments, different development speeds and capacities <coughs> together. So Silicon Valley is one example. Probably have, we have a couple that could, be the, could have the potential for that. But as was mentioned before, it's linked at European level to cohesion policy, to other policy areas that have, have to fit together. So it's really a comprehensive, a more comprehensive approach. And with the new framework program being a driver, but a, a, a puzzle, a, an element in the puzzle. Well, I've seen, I've seen cohesion policy at work in F7 programs, and I find it very destructive. Of course. Um, because, to, you know, after we went through and selected F-27 space projects, guess what? They bring in 27 countries. Yeah. 27 countries. We're not in the room. We've long gone, but a few weeks later, a month later, to assess and look at the, you know, did we get our fair share? And so then they reorder. There's this big discussion, dialogue, debate, battle. This goes on, you know, at all levels of the commission. Yeah. So you have politics interfering with the innovation process uh, at a much deeper level than you do here in the United States. So I think there's a fundamental tension between cohesion and integration objectives and the innovation agenda of, of Europe. Because ultimately, innovation cannot make investment decisions based on political 
reasons. They have to be based on sound business reasons for it to be a sustainable innovation system. And the commission injects politics, it's built to inject politics into every single decision it makes when it comes to investment. And I think one of the reasons that, uh, that the commission may never uh, formally put in place the commercialization program for FP is because most of the benefits, most of the companies that would be created out of that would be created in the UK, Germany, Switzerland, Silicon Valley, uh, Finland, not in Romania or Bulgaria or Estonia or Poland. And so the benefits of that commercialization are going to be very uneven. So uh, let's take a question from Philip Maske from Austria, Montserrat from Spain, and then uh, for uh, Just uh, some comments. Uh, the first thing that I would like to mention is uh, the European Union research budget is just about 5% on what's spent all over Europe, but then of course you can think it's more on competitive uh, funding. So it's just part of what happens in the member states. And also there's a lot happening uh, in member states when it comes to commercialization of research programs. And also we don't have an SBIR, but there are countries which adopt SBIR, if we have a similar program with different name. So there's a lot happening on the member states level. And another comment on space policy. Space policy is, is, is a bit complicated because you have had the European Space Agency, which was established, I don't know, 50 years ago, and, and, and maybe 10 or 20 years ago, the European Union, or the, then the European uh, co uh, community, started to have a competency in space. And now you have ESA, you have the European Union. ESA has a different membership uh, composition than the EU does, uh, and this, this all makes it more complicated. Uh, and then <coughs> in ESA you have just the shoes retour, so every, whatever you pay in comes, flows back into money. In the European Union, you have uh, the excellence uh, scheme. Uh, so that's also a difference. And I wanted to make another point, but I think I, I don't want to go on uh, for him to make that statement. Well, one around Valencia, Spain. I would like just to raise a topic you have mentioned during your, your presentation. I mean, it's the fact of the globalization of innovation, the globalization of R&D. Uh, namely multinationals moving R&D activities <coughs> abroad. I happened to read the, 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 the report uh, by the National Academies uh, last year, I think it was issued, and one of the main recommendations was for the US to monitor or to just to, to keep attention to the fact that American uh, multinationals are moving their R&D activities. My, my question is, is to you, you have the feeling that Understanding that Europe is not a, a single entity, but in this national, uh, I'm sorry, European agenda of innovation, do you have the feeling that Europe has the same concern? Uh, same concern about European? About European multinationals moving, moving the, the R&D, maybe, to emerging countries. No, I have not heard that being a major concern. You know, I've never heard that around discussions around Philips or the big pharmaceutical companies. And I, my sense is that it's it maybe more difficult for European multinationals to do that, uh, to move it overseas than for American for legal reasons or political reasons. Um, so no, I have never heard that being, being an issue. Um, you know, when 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 you think of major overseas companies establishing research groups in China or India, what comes to mind are GE, Microsoft, Google, for example. Offhand, I can't think of a single major European company. Uh, I'm sure there's a couple. If you follow ITIP's work in this space, you'll see that we talk about an innovation triangle. We say that for countries, it's to see that innovation, they have to get three parts of the triangle right. The innovation policy environment, the regulatory environment, and the business environment. And that no nation or region of the world has it just right yet. So I, I think uh, the message there is that we all have opportunities to learn from the smart things that other countries are doing and fill in the gaps in some of our own regions. So I think this has been an invaluable exploration of uh, innovation policy in Europe. I encourage you, if you have questions afterward, to come up and, and, and speak with uh, Dr. Lee if you can spare a few more minutes. Um, I'm told that uh, uh, the slide deck uh, will be available um, uh, in the next couple of days on our website, so look for that. And uh, a final round of thank you for the presentation today. Thank you.